Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll go ahead and find your seats, we'll be starting in just a few moments. Thank you.
Well, good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Harry Lightsey, and I am honored to serve uh, as South Carolina Secretary of Commerce. It is my certain honor and pleasure to welcome you to Governor McMaster's inaugural Energy Summit. Today's discussion and dialogue will set the stage to ensure South Carolina's power generation future and the subsequent resiliency that will bolster our economy and our communities for continued long-term success. Uh, at the Department of Commerce, we've done some uh, benchmarking in the past few months, and one of the things we discovered is that in the, the last several years, uh, South Carolina's manufacturing economy has grown at a rate that's twice uh, the national average. And certainly that, that continued growth is something that we're very proud of and very interested in. It's indicative of our business-friendly environment and capabilities uh, to help new companies and existing companies grow and thrive in South Carolina. Our state and our people are among the best in the world, and we want to continue boosting South Carolina's global re reputation and building upon our economic development success to, to remain competitive throughout the Southeast, the nation, and the world. To maintain our economic competitiveness and to continue recruiting globally renowned companies, good paying jobs, and generational growth for our citizens we must strategically consider our natural and industrial resources. Modern industry is being driven by increasingly advanced, innovative, and cleaner technologies, demanding that our utilities evolve at much the same pace. Today's Energy Summit will convene policymakers, elected officials, industry leaders, and stakeholders to discuss strategic trends, technologies, and that together we can, we can ensure South Carolina's energy resiliency and support that energy evolution right here at home. We look forward to today's discussions and the foundation they will lay for further building the energy infrastructure that will boldly lead South Carolina into the future. At the conclusion of today's program, we invite all of our attendees, all of you, to join us for Governor McMaster's press conference, unveiling an executive order to prioritize action that ensures our state's energy resiliency. We thank you so much for your interest and for your uh, attendance here today and support in this critically important topic. Uh, without further ado, it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our Governor, Henry McMaster. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and let me add my welcome to this beautiful place here at the great University of South Carolina. The President, Dr. Amaritus, was outside greeting a little while ago along with two of the board members, Thad Westbrook and Dan Adams, but you're all welcome. This is a beautiful place. You're right in the, I know a lot of you live here close by, but for those that don't, uh, walk around when you get a chance and take a look, and, um, and you'll like what you see. I want to invite everybody to, to feel free to roam, to talk. Uh, we have a lot of people here who know a lot, and our goal here, as Harry has mentioned, is to try to see where we're going and how we're going to get there without wasting time, energy, and effort, because you, you do a lot better when you all know what you're going in the same direction. Not long ago, we had an electric vehicle summit up in Greenville and it was done in connection with the National Governors Association. We had people from all over the country there, and afterwards, or at that meeting, the conclusion, I issued an executive order setting up a one-stop shop, essentially, for electric vehicle information and advice and direction, including the Department of Commerce, Department of Transportation, the Office of the Regulatory Staff that handles the 
power and all of that, and it's, it's working. And as you know, we've had Mercedes here for a while, Volvo here, BMW, and now Scout is coming, and all of them are going to make electric vehicles. So it dawned on us after we all being geniuses, we figured out, well, we're going to have to have some more electric power. So that led to the idea of bringing us together here in this place to discuss that and, and what we can do in South Carolina and how we fit into what goes on in the rest of the country and the rest of the world. We have a lot of celebrated folks here. I didn't see the speaker Merle Smith. I think he's coming. I know uh, Senator Alexander, Senate President. I don't think he's here yet, but he's coming. I know Senator Tom Davis is here. Tom, stand up, please. That's one of our leaders in the state Senate. Appreciate you being here. And is, is Representative Nathan Ballantyne here? Has he come? Well, we'll have some more coming as we go along. Uh, and Ken Nemeth is here. He's the executive director of the Southern States Energy Board, which I chaired last year and will chair and chairing now. Is uh, where'd Ken go? Would you please please stand? Thank you. Southern States Energy Board. Y'all, just briefly, it's, uh, everything's coming south. As you saw in the pandemic, there were great decisions made in, in this state and in others. And in this state, we relied on something we called Accelerate SC, which had 30 members, representatives from every segment of the economy, our society, academia, education, agriculture, and everything in between. And by communicating, collaborating, and cooperating, that's how we fashioned our plan which took us right straight through it. We just happened to break just a little bit, unlike other states who closed down. And they're still suffering, and of course, we're booming. Last year, we had our best year ever with 10.27, uh, I think, Harry, uh, capital investment, and I can't remember, 80,000 jobs or something like that. And this year, seems that it's gonna be even better than that. And so the key is, is quite clear from that experience that when we work together and think together and plan together and don't get in each other's way, we can really succeed. So that's what we're going to do. And we have um, people coming to this state from all over. But we are mainly nuclear powered. And I think that's a, a good idea. I'll tell you a cute story about people coming to South Carolina. Y'all remember the tennis, great tennis player Stan Smith lives down in uh, Hilton Head. He and his wife, Margie, he was the, he won just about everything from 69 through 73, uh, national championships, U.S. Open, Wimbledon, the WTL finals in 73 in Dallas. Uh, I mean, he just, he beat everybody, beat Arthur Ashe, Rod Laver, um, Eli Nastasi, all of them. Anyway, we, I went down to Hilton Head, Peggy and I did, to give him the order of the Palmetto, which is a recognition that we have in the state for people who have helped the state. And he was told me that he moved, they moved to Hilton Head in 1970. And I said, well, that's we're glad you're here. And he said, well, we uh, came to the end of the year. We were gonna stay just for a year while I was doing some tennis stuff. And at the end of the year, Margie, we were talking. I said, well, it's about time to move back to California. And she said, why? And he says, it's been 53 years, and I haven't been able to answer that question yet. <laughs> so they are still here in South Carolina at Hilton Head. Getting on to why we are here, some of us will remember the oil embargo back in 73 and 74. Remember Nixon changed, took us off the gold standard, and also we helped Israel in the Yom Kippur War. And OPEC, which is the oil-producing, uh, petroleum-producing, companies, exporting companies, put an embargo on us from about October to March. Some of you might remember, I was up in Washington as a young staffer for Strom Thurmond, and I remember you couldn't get gas. I mean, it was gone. And finally, when we got moving again, the filling station operators were out in the street with coats and ties on, taking reservations to get to the gas pump. And you were allowed to get, I think, 10 gallons at a time, that's all. And then uh, some, some states went to odd and even on the last number of your license plate. If it's odd, you go on this day, and it's even, you go on the other day. Uh, and it was really something. And just as that was going along, which lasted to March, somehow we had a scare on toilet paper. And everybody was hoarding toilet paper. And you go in, y'all believe that? 
and you, that's the kind of stuff that can happen. And you'd go into a big grocery store, there wouldn't be a roll of toilet paper, It'd be all kind of shelves, not a thing on it. I see some heads nodding. Well, that's, that demonstrated to me as, as a young guy that we are, that every part of the world affects every other part of the world. And so our job is to be sure that this country is energy independent and be sure that our state plays the right role to be sure that we are safe and happy and prosperous here in South Carolina. So I want to thank all of you for being here. I think we're going to have, a, have great panels. We're going to have great discussions. I encourage you during the breaks to get to know each other because we all going to be working together. One of the best things we've done already is to have name tags you can read from 20 feet away. That's, so we, we're off to a real good start. So remember this, when good things happen, they happen here in South Carolina first, and they happen fast. So let's all get on board. Thank you. So as our panelists come up and, and get situated, um, our first panel that y'all are going to hear today is uh, titled Preparing for Future Energy Needs, How South Carolina's Energy Production and Economic Growth Prepares Our Landscape. This panel will address the crucial needs to ensure reliable energy capacity for driving economic growth in South Carolina. And it will be moderated by Secretary Leitze, who will take it away and, and introduce you to your panel. Great. Well, good morning again. Uh, seems like I was just up here. Um, so we have a, a great panel to get us started. Very briefly, let me introduce them. What we'll do is each one of us will take uh, about five minutes to talk about uh, issues as we see them from our per perspective of our, our various agencies. And uh, then I have a few questions, and then you know, we'll see if we have any time left after that to have a chat with the audience. So. Just very briefly, our panel, uh, Director Nanette Edwards with the Office of Regulatory Staff, um, Chairman Seema Shifrastava Patel with uh, DHEC, and our Chief Resiliency Officer, uh, Ben Duncan. That's a great panel. So uh, I'm gonna lead this off and I will talk uh, very briefly a, a little bit about uh, where we see uh, this world uh, from an economic development uh, perspective. and. As I mentioned in my uh, introductory remarks, you know, South Carolina has had uh, a remarkable history of economic growth over the last 10 years. And, and of course, South Carolina continues to be uh, one of the, the fastest growing states in the, in the country. Uh, ever since I came into this job about two months ago, I, I believe that we are truly in transformational time. And if you think about uh, what we've seen uh, just in the last couple of years uh, in the automobile industry where they are truly experiencing more change uh, than they've experienced in their previous 100 years you know they are uh, truly I think kind of the uh, at the forefront of, of this kind of transformational change but I think we will see that across many other business sectors many other businesses as uh, technologies like artificial intelligence uh, robotics um, uh, really uh, affect uh, business models and create uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, in South Carolina, uh, we've been very, as the governor mentioned, we've been very deliberate. Of course, we had a very established automobile uh, sector uh, in South Carolina uh, since 1992 when BMW announced that they were going to uh, put their first uh, production facility outside of Germany in South Carolina. Now uh, we have uh, over uh, 70,000 South Carolinians working in the automobile industry. So as the industry made this pivot, it was certainly very important to us that South Carolina be, be part of that uh, change. And uh, we are very fortunate to attract, uh, to have companies like BMW and Volvo here that are, were making uh, momentous uh, announcements about how they were uh, going to change. Uh, our goal was to really support that from a supply chain uh, standpoint, 
and uh, we were great uh, to work with uh, AESC and BMW to bring AESC to South Carolina to be uh, BMW's battery uh, supplier. Uh, we also uh, were very fortunate with Redwood Materials, the battery re recycling uh, company, uh, to bring uh, them to South Carolina, and that really puts us at the forefront of uh, being able to provide uh, the materials that, that are used to produce uh, batteries uh, here in the state. It's like having uh, nickel mines and coal, uh, cobalt mines uh, right here in South Carolina, uh, having an asset like uh, Redwood Materials, uh, Serba Solutions, uh, another company here in Richland County is uh, doing the same thing. And then uh, Albemarle, which is headquartered in Charlotte, locating uh, a lithium refining center uh, in, in uh, Chester County, uh, which uh, will be the, the main raw ingredient for uh, batteries for, for decades to come. So we really have the foundations of a circular economy in uh, EVs in, in our state. And we think that is a set of assets that's unique and will allow us to be competitive for generations to come. We're really, what we want to do is to to do that same kind of uh, effort in, in other areas, particularly in the energy sector. We think technologies uh, like um, uh, smart grid and cybersecurity, uh, small uh, nuclear, modular nuclear uh, reactors, uh, green hydrogen, uh, energy storage, and uh, offshore wind are all areas where South Carolina can be very competitive from an economic development perspective and, um, and we look forward to uh, working hard to create those kind of assets here in our state uh, to create great jobs for our citizens for, for years to come. So now I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Director Nanette Edwards. Uh, and uh, uh, Nanette, maybe you can give us some, some thoughts. Well, um, let me start by, um, thank you uh, again, and let me start by and for those of you in the industry and many of you here, you know what I'm about to say in terms of our generation mix. If you look at what we physically have in our state, we do have seven operating nuclear units. We have 11 uh, coal-fired generation units. We have 18 natural gas units. That's what we physically generate. But we also share a utility with another state, North Carolina. Duke operates in two states. So when you look at our pro rata generation between the two states, we're actually more like 30, 30, 30. 38 percent nuclear, 27 uh, percent um, uh, coal, and 32 percent natural gas. The reason I focus on natural gas is we don't have natural gas. We're not Texas, so we don't have natural gas in our state. We do rely on pipelines to bring that natural gas into our state. Pre-2005, you didn't have natural gas as a baseload form of electric generation. In fact, the industries that many of whom may even be in this room, it was used for, by manufacturers. But we, it was even after 2005, we had the hurricanes, natural gas was, as a commodity, was priced fairly high. But then we had a period of low natural gas prices. And that, in turn, has caused us, as a recent trend over the past, I'd say, 10 years, we have turned more to natural gas as a form of baseload electric generation. Interestingly, our last baseload generation unit built in our state was the Duke Lee plant in Anderson, South Carolina, 750 megawatts. That's more than five years ago. So we sit here today, and we've had incredible economic growth led by Governor McMaster and the Department of Commerce, and we've been so fortunate. But not only do we have to meet our existing customer needs for generation, power generation, but we also have to prepare for the future. Um, and by that, what I mean is fortunately, on a bright note, um, the re recent news is um, the Mount Valley Pipeline looks like it's going to move forward, and that will alleviate some natural gas constraints. Um, on a not, not uh, what's given me a lot of work here recently, however, is um, the EPA under the Clean Air Act has proposed a new rule that would um, really deter 
building of new natural gas uh, generation. And, and I'm hopeful that with our leadership, we can uh, convince the EPA otherwise. Um, and, I, and moving from that, you know, people ask me, well, well, how do we move forward with these challenges? Uh, build new power generation, uh, changing regulatory landscape. My answer has been all of the above, especially in meeting our immediate power needs. Uh, I had the experience of working with many of our electric utilities during winter storm Elliott. And I just have to tell you, they do work hard. Uh, they're out there um, maintaining that energy for us. And what I, would, what I have noticed is in terms of our immediate need, I love all kilowatt hours. Um, so I love solar, I love coal, and I, I love natural gas because at the end of the day, we have to have that reliability. Um, and, and we're not the only ones that are struggling with this issue. Entire nations are dealing with the issues of power generation in terms of affordability and reliability. And so how, some things that I have thoughts of are, just like we did with broadband, we were given a deadline, a tight deadline in, in pushing out broadband infrastructure. We can take lessons learned from that and determine that, let's get all our groups for permitting together. Uh, we did that on a voluntary basis and we made tremendous progress. We, we can do things within the current laws, but we also probably should take a look at, for example, the Siting Act. Are there things that we can do differently that we can streamline our opportunities to encourage gener power generation being built in our state, as well as transmission lines to import power into our state? I want to close with um, uh, taking a line from our governor. You know, we can turn these challenges into opportunities. And South Carolina, that's our strength. We communicate, we collaborate, and we coordinate. Great. Thank you, Nanette. So we now are uh, going to get to hear from uh, Chairman uh, Seema Shivastava she, she Patel. <laughs> With Good. <laughs> you know, it's a... Uh, I like how you didn't look at your notes. I'm going to look at my notes. <laughs> you did a fantastic job. Um, my name is Seema Srivastava Patel, and I'm chairman of the Department of Environmental and Health Control. Um, it's a pleasure for being here, and thank you, Governor and Lieutenant Governor and uh, everybody else. We appreciate it. You know, uh, DHEC, just like many of you, plays a vital role in the energy industry here in South Carolina. And before we say anything else, we want you to know that DHEC is a big supporter of the energy industry. Having innovation and having new clean energies is a must for the state of South Carolina to be successful for the future. You know, from permitting to inspections, staff in the Environmental Affairs Division work every day with energy businesses around the state to ensure that they operate safely and successfully. And DHEC is charged with the regulatory oversight, but we're not always the bad guys. We are here to lend a hand when you need us. Having, sorry, in South Carolina, businesses may have to get permits, approvals, compliance, oversight for our programs. We try to maintain good working relationships with energy businesses during permitting processes. We try to be a collaborative hand and guide through questioning through regulatory laws and state laws. We, our staff also works closely with federal partners, specifically the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We also work with our state agencies, all of these state agencies, the Office of, Re Office of Regulatory Staff, the Department of Commerce, Office of Resilience, and others to stay educated and informed about the industry. I take pride in saying that you know, in our environmental affairs office, we have a few members that are on national stakeholder boards, like Myra. Uh, are you here, Myra Reese? Stand up. Everybody should get to know you. <laughs> Myra is in charge of our environmental affairs department. An incredible, incredible resource, and she's the best thing we have for the state of South Carolina. She will be the new director for when the department splits, and we are nothing but excited for that. I think we have an asset here. Um, she serves as president, and am I correct, Myra, of the Environmental Council of the States, is that correct? Yep, yep, and we are incredibly thrilled and proud of that. 
and association, we also have people that serve on the Association of Air Pollution and Control. You know, in South Carolina, DHEC is committed to continually streamlining and improving the permitting process. You know, I've heard from many of you, even last night, that sometimes our permitting can be slow. Yes, hiring people and having those funds that we need to streamline that, you know, we have to rely on our state house to fund us that way. Yes, we are working on streamlining with technology and new practices and trying to do the best we can to move as fast as we can so money's not wasted on the table. Um, we're not all papers and permits. We're not all regulatory. We engage with our partners. We meet with our stakeholders. We want to be partners with you. We want to sit at the table in the beginning to understand where the regulatory issues are coming so we can help change and make effective, um, make the energy industry a success. Sorry for that befundle right there. Um, you know, we look forward, DHEC looks forward to collaborating with agencies and businesses and organizations uh, to make the energy industry a success here in South Carolina. Our future looks very bright. Thank you. Thank you. And DHEC, DHEC is an incredible partner uh, is for, our, for our department, and we've really enjoyed working with them in that relationship. And now we have uh, one of our newer state agencies and our chief resiliency officer, uh, Ben Duncan. Thank you, Harry. Uh, I think I need to take a little different approach than, than, uh, than the, the two other guests have. Uh, usually when I tell people I'm with the Office of Resilience, I get to stare. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, the Office of Resilience uh, was established in uh, 2020. We didn't get a budget until 2021. Prior to that, we were the Disaster Recovery Office. Uh, in 2017, uh, Governor McMaster came into office and he, is, he experienced uh, Hurricane Matthew. And the governor said, we need to do more than be disaster recovery. We need to work on the front end of these disasters. And so he established the Floodwater Commission and from the Floodwater Commission's uh, report and recommendations, uh, the governor and the legislature created the Office of Resilience. And our mission is to lessen the impact of disasters on our citizens and our communities, our economies, and our ecosystem. And how do we do that? We anticipate a disaster. And how do we anticipate? We put in infrastructure systems that will help lessen the impact. We have our plans and studies uh, for future disasters. Uh, we're data driven. We look at rainfall and intensity and duration. All those things we are preparing for prior to disaster. We absorb, that's our next step. We absorb the disaster from all of the mitigation programs we put together, all of the data collection and all. Then we recover. And that's part of our office, disaster recovery. We recover. We recover as quickly as possible through all those mitigation measures. And then we thrive, meaning we are firing on all systems that this could be a great state. All of our economic systems are, are firing on, on all levels, our economy, and our citizens are recovering. To give you some, you know, a better understanding of what, I, what I'm saying with these words, through all disasters, we have assisted by repairing and replacing over 3,325 homes for low to moderate income individuals. These homes are more resilient, they're stronger, they're more energy efficient. Uh, one lady said she had three window air units now she has a HVAC unit, which is more energy efficient. Energy efficient appliances. The homes are well built and fully insulated at the levels that they should be. That's how we're helping our citizens. Currently, we have 37 stormwater infrastructure projects that we've awarded. Many of them are under construction now. 
Others will be under construction very soon. And we're planning on about eight more, so a total of about 45 infrastructure systems, that, uh, stormwater infrastructure systems that should be in place uh, by the end of the year or either the uh, grants have been awarded. We also have 20 plans and studies for, ci for cities and counties that don't understand their flooding issue and their flooding problems. And again, all this is to lessen the impact on everyone. We also have six home buyout projects. These are buying citizens out, moving them out from where they live, turning it into green space, uh, putting a, a, a restrictive deed on the, on the properties so that another residence can't be built there, and moving these people out of harm's way. These are the things that we're putting in place uh, for the future. One big project that we have that's due July 1 of this year, this is right around the corner, is that we have a statewide resilience plan looking at the state's vulnerabilities and looking at ways to, to reduce those vulnerabilities. Uh, the, again, the report's due in a few weeks. I'm asking the governor, since I'm here all day, that he give me one more day on it. <laughs> but it, but, but it's, it's a plan that we can use as a guide for our future development of mitigation projects and to lessen the impact on our state, which means lessen the impact on our energy infrastructure. So all of these things are working together for our future, for all of us, and including our energy infrastructure. Thank you very much, man. So uh, I've, I've got a few. Got a few questions. Um, we'll go through those, and then we'll see if we have any time left. Uh, we'll, we'll perhaps uh, have a time to chat with uh, the audience here. So, um, uh, Director Edwards, uh, sometimes uh, to get a picture of where you're headed, you, you need to look at where you've been. Uh, could you speak to the state's past and current gen uh, energy generation mix and any recent trends? Um, thank you. Um well, we have historically been a nuclear state. I know the governor mentioned it. I kind of mentioned uh, we have seven op operating nuclear units in our state. Um, you know, we're, we went through a process where we've, um, especially now, and I know all of you have seen it in the news, uh, there's uh, planned retirements of these coal-fired generation units that's happening uh, internationally and, and nationally. I think one of the trends that, that I see that we have to be prepared for is needing replacement generation. Um, I was on a Southeastern Reliability, uh, the CERC um, reports under NERC, and NERC has the responsibility for our nation's grid, the reliability of our nation's grid. And so just last week I was on a conference call and CERC referenced in our region nine gigawatts of retirements in under 10 years. One gigawatt serves 750,000 homes. I, I gulped. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of retirements um, and a lot of power being retired in a short period of time. We, we again, um, you know, we need to have an all of the above. Um, uh, Harry, you mentioned uh, innovative technologies. Um, you know, we do need to look at an all-of-the-above uh, approach to meeting our, our current energy needs, but also to meet that load growth. Thank you. So Chairman uh, Srivastava, Srivastava Patel, <laughs> sure. I'm getting better. Uh, can you provide us with some examples of how DHEC can, through regulation, improve or positively impact our energy and economic landscape? I'll have a uh, naming ceremony after that. Everybody can learn <laughs> to say my name later on today if you'd like. <laughs> um, but thank you for trying. You really did a great job. <clears throat> I can answer that question in, you know, three points. 
One is streamlining our permitting process. I know I've heard a lot from you that you know, permitting takes too long, um, and so we identified as a team that new technologies that can streamline that, you know, goal setting, uh, putting very large projects and uh, putting a key person on that, um, and making sure that our staff realizes they're not just in four walls, they are buying into stakeholders and their needs and understanding what that time link means to the stakeholder. Second is identifying best practices with other states and learning from them. Third is permitting uh, permit reform. And that means how, getting us in the beginning of the discussion for regulations, getting us in the beginning of stakeholders, businesses, and if you need anything, have us at the table to understand so we understand what's coming, how to help you go through the regulatory issues, um, and how get, let us have feedback in that. And we think as a team, um, I think that would be very one of the pivotal points to have is getting us in the beginning of the process. Um, so yeah, thank Great. you. Thank you. So uh, Chief Resilience Officer uh, Duncan, uh, when it comes to energy needs, uh, what resiliency challenges are most pressing for our state and what opportunities do you see? First of all, Harry, you need to uh, thank me. You can say Ben Duncan very easily. <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> in, our, in, our, in our resilience plan, it covers a lot. Um, it covers parts of energy and, and other uh, economies. Um, but one focus that we have is looking at our conservation measures in the state, preserving our wetlands uh, to mitigate flooding and if we preserve our wetlands and we can conserve our wetlands, that reduces the flooding. And it also prevents development in areas where we shouldn't develop, which also saves our citizens. Because in Sumter, I'm from Sumter, South Carolina. That's where I grew up. I was born in Barnwell, though. But in Sumter, when you come from Sumter to uh, Columbia, we, we, when, we, when I was growing up, we said the swamp between the two cities there. Uh, now we call it the wetlands. Uh, <laughs> the swamp acts, uh, asks, acts as the kidneys, and it holds the water, and it slows it down before it gets to the waterways. And we need to keep in mind in our development the areas that we need to save and conserve to prevent future problems in this state. And as you know, flooding is the greatest problem they have or the biggest risk that we have in this state. And that's something that we all need to keep in mind and that we all need to work together on in preventing overdevelopment of our wetlands. So that's another focus that we have. We have many focuses, but that is one that we have also that is key uh, to this state. Well, great, thank you. So uh, one thing I'll say, I've uh, been in state government now for almost two years, um, and uh, one thing that I've learned is that uh, this state in particular, our, our agencies work together incredibly well, and uh, the Department of Commerce has a fantastic relationship with, the, with all of the agencies that are here uh, on the stage with me, uh, and they have work tirelessly to support our efforts to continue to support our businesses that are here in South Carolina and, and uh, to help us with the, the businesses that are looking at coming to our state. Uh, that, is, that has really been a true learning for me is how well together uh, our state agencies work and, and how uh, we all get behind uh, each other uh, to support our, our efforts. So uh, I thank uh, each and every one of y'all. It's, uh, it's been a true experience uh, for me to, to learn, uh, to get to know you and, and work, work with your agencies. And I truly appreciate everything y'all do to support the uh, Department of Commerce here. Um, and since I'm the moderator, you'll notice I don't uh, have a question for myself. So that's one of the privileges of being a moderator. Uh, but we wanted to kind of make sure that we had uh, the right number of questions. So uh, Nanette gets two questions. Um, so uh, 
Director Edwards, uh, with the unprecedented economic growth that, that we talked about, uh, what challenges and opportunities do you foresee as we work to ensure our state's future energy needs are met? Well, I do think our future is bright. Uh, I do think our future is bright. Uh, we, have, um, we have a great working group, H Harry, you said it well, um, with DHEC, um, the Office of Resiliency, Ben. Uh, we do have some wonderful opportunities. Um, we've got an incredible history. Uh, behind us with nuclear. We have these nuclear units that have been serving us um, so well. We do have the opportunity to attract um, and have attracted business and industry. Um, we have the, you're leading the um, charge, so to speak, on EV. So we have that going for us as well. I, what I think we can do in terms of meeting those challenges is look at ways to encourage um, power generation in our state, uh, whether it's through the bridge, what I call the bridge, natural gas, but also looking at other ways and in innovative technologies that, um, well, let's face it, um, Harry and I both came out of telecom in 1980s. So you had the car phone, right? Well, look at what we have now. I do think there is a, a really bright technological future. Um, we talk about storage. We talk about, um, Harry mentioned the hydrogen hub. That's an exi exciting opportunity, uh, um, offshore wind. So we do have those abilities to move forward. I, I do think, and um, we have this over at the Public Service Commission of South Carolina, we're encouraging our utilities to take full advantage of the Infl uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and, and this has not quite landed on our doorstep, but it's coming. The Inflation Reduction Act provides um, opportunities for um, consumers to uh, make their homes more energy efficient. And as part of that, communicate, collaborate, and coordinate. Just last night, I had our energy office meet with uh, Ben, uh, and we're gonna get together later and compare those 3,000 homes and start thinking, well, are there existing homes that will benefit under the uh, energy efficiency provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act? So there are things that we can do for our, our customers, our residential customers, but also um, I want to leave our industrial customers with the knowledge that this leadership team here in South Carolina is very committed to meeting um, the growth needs, um, and we're looking at every way, um, I, I like to call it again, an all of the above approach to meeting the needs of our um, industrial and commercial customers. Thank you. So I guess we've got a, a few minutes here uh, where we can uh, take some questions. Uh, if there are any that are out there, I guess uh, if you can raise your hand. So we see one, one hand over here. Harry, we're gonna use a microphone. Oh, okay, great. So if you raise your hand, we'll, we'll get a microphone to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Travis Knight. I'm chair of mechanical aerospace and nuclear energy uh, engineering at the University of South Carolina. I've been in South Carolina for 20 years, so it's now I consider it home, but I grew up in Florida which has certainly issues of energy resiliency, as you can imagine, with weather-related events. Um, but I remember sitting in a meeting 30 years ago with Florida Power and Light, the university, I was with the University of Florida at the time. And it was recognized that to kind of, we didn't call it renaissance back then, but with nuclear, there should be a uh, confluence of interest from whether it's architect engineers, the vendors, the utilities, all coming together to make you know, the, the first kind of restart of building new nuclear power in the United States. Um, basically to have skin in the game, Every, everyone to have skin in the game to make that possible. Uh, I think if you look around South Carolina, we're very blessed, as many have mentioned, we have, you know, we have a vendor, we have a, a fuel manufacturer, we have utilities that are heavily invested in nuclear power already. Um, we have Savannah Riverside, if you bring that in, you have back into the fuel cycle with lots of technology and uh, intellectual uh, capacity there and capabilities. I think bl blessed is, a, is a, the most appropriate word, word to use when it, when it comes to uh, this whole portfolio of, of energy technologies and opportunities. 
So I guess, I guess the question is how to bring those together then and, and to make this a reality. And I think uh, I applaud all the efforts that uh, this panel uh, brings to bear on that. So uh, I guess uh, what, what, uh, what is the direction then to include that back end of the fuel cycle as well, maybe that would bring in this portfolio of technology and bringing the, the, the players together to, to have that skin in the game. So thank you. Let, let me talk a little bit about that first, and then uh, we'll, we'll ask the, if the rest of the panel has any thoughts. But, um, you know, from, the, uh, from an economic development per perspective, you know, I certainly recognize and agree with you. We have in South Carolina this uh, fundamental, uh, we've been blessed with these uh, assets that I, I don't think uh, any other state has, uh, the Savannah River site, um, our, his our history in terms of uh, our generation mix, uh, we have uh, facilities like Westinghouse uh, right outside of Columbia here that uh, has been uh, in, in the business, in the nuclear business for, for decades. Uh, so we have workforce. Uh, uh, SC State is the only uh, HBCU in the country that has a program in, in nuclear engineering. Uh, so we have uh, the workforce and we have the capability to produce a new workforce and certainly USC and Clemson uh, as well. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, the future is bright for us. Uh, we are uh, certainly uh, at Commerce, we believe uh, that the new technology in nuclear, uh, uh, in particular uh, small uh, modular reactors, has uh, a lot of promise and uh, we have the right assets in our states to capitalize on that as we go forward and we're, we're going to aggressively pursue that. So, um, Nanette, I don't know if you have any other thoughts. You covered it really very well. Um, the only thing I would add is uh, I, I see a lot of discussion, um, the uh, utilities um, in their integrated resource planning, I know that they are looking uh, carefully at SMRs. Um, there is a lot of discussion going on. I'm also aware that some states are, um, you know, have put uh, a little bit of muscle into looking at um, ways to encourage. Uh, we kind of have a little bit of a leg up in one respect because of our history with nuclear. Um, so I, I think there is a lot of interest and a lot of discussion going on um, in our state. Dan Sima? Okay. Um, I think we had one over here. Um, Good morning, I'm Catherine Hayes with the South Carolina Research Authority, and thank you so much, this is an excellent panel. Um, we are very privileged that uh, we've been awarded uh, in South Carolina and North Carolina a Type 1 NSF engine grant on clean energy, and I'm grateful to uh, three of your offices for providing a letter of collaboration, which means there's actually, it's more than a letter of support, it's actually resources that will be deployed for this. Uh, my question is, are there any renewable energies that uh, we really should be focused on in terms of what South Carolina's interests are and any that we should maybe um, lessen our, our uh, focus and interest? Um, thank you for the question. Um, so 2014, uh, the legislature uh, passed Act 236, and I'd say from 2014 forward, you have seen more and more solar. Um, that is, I would say, predominantly the renewable source. Um, we do have pump storage. We do have some. Hi we do have some hydro. So I don't want to leave that out. But I think one of the things that people are asking, and I'm hearing it more myself, is, you know, South Carolina is a fairly small state in 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 terms of we want to use our land wisely. So when you start talking about uh, large uses of land, you know, one of the things in meeting our energy challenges is going to be the question of what gets you the best bang for your buck, so to speak. You, 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 use, you look at your land utilization, you look at how many megawatts you can, can generate from that resource, what is actually going to give us the most um, for our, our opportunity there. Uh, I think you asked um, the question lessening, I don't know if it's lessening, I think it's just being more efficient. I think we need to be more efficient and, and also kind of like where we look at EV, where is the best place to put it in terms of meeting our power generation needs? 
location, you know, I guess real estate agents say location, location, location. In a way, that's kind of where we are with our, our power generation. I don't know if that fully answered your question, but I also don't want to take anything off the table because I think we need to, again, pursue aggressively that all of the above. Oh, please, yeah. Um, you know, you brought up a very good point about land, 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 and, you know, location, location, location. In our family's history, we had a chain of convenience stores, and I was president of the Association of Convenience Stores um, for a very long time. Uh, and one of the things that useful, good use of land is to already use what we have. They're at great sites, the convenience stores. They are right on the interstate. And utilizing what we have and not wasting the rest of South Carolina's property is probably, in my opinion, one of the best things we can do. The other concern that we're starting to see is, you know, recycling of solar, solar panels when they're coming to end of life. And what are we going to do about that? We need more recycling companies to come in to take care of that so we're not just going into landfills. Yeah, uh, I was actually talking to uh, a business that's uh, that here in South Carolina uh, Yesterday, uh, uh, Schneider uh, Electric, uh, they were they were telling me that um, with uh, the technologies that they're developing, uh, they have uh, gone into some areas on a, on a trial basis and deploying uh, modern, uh, very cutting edge sensor technology and everything. They've been able to increase uh, the efficiency of our existing resources and by tremendous amount. Uh, they, they mentioned uh, in one trial, I think 26 percent increase in efficiency just by putting uh, new uh, sensors and monitoring capabilities on uh, existing assets. And I think that kind of innovation is, is the kind of innovation we want to encourage uh, here in South Carolina. I think those are the kind of solutions, you know, that we may not have even heard of yet um, that uh, or will provide us uh, with the path to the future. Uh, ben, if you got anything you want to, we've been asked questions uh, regarding uh, wind farms, those kind of things, uh, and we've given our advice on it. Uh, but uh, w w there is there is a future there, but it d needs to be in the right places and uh, with with the right uh, return on it. Yep. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Thank you very much for this panel. My name is Pamela Greenlaw. I'm the current chair of the local Midlands group of Sierra Club. My question is to all three of you, primarily uh, from uh, Mr. Duncan. Um, when we talk about citing things in the right place, you're looking at the ecosystem services that nature provides for free so that we don't have to cre recreate the, you know, structures to mitigate flooding, and this is true in other areas of energy. What we, we may have to look at the environmental justice effects of innovations and sightings, because as, as Mr. Duncan pointed out, and this is it's going to be a question, as Mr. Duncan pointed out, you have a resilience plan where can something go? Where should it go? Where should it not go? That's related to the environment as well as for where people already live. So my question is, what regulatory structures need to be in place to give the resilience plan teeth so that we're not racing toward economic development without looking at the full range of impacts on the environment and on the people who already live near the areas that are going to be impacted. And, I, I, and that, so um, I would like to hear, from, we would like to hear from all three of you on that question. Thank you. Okay, let's we'll start off there. Well, I, I, I see where you're headed with this. Uh, in all that we do, we look at the effect on people, and especially those who are in the low to moderate income areas. Uh, we, we focus on that primarily when we start a project or if we are looking at part of our plan. 
uh, to make sure that there's no adverse effect for those who live in, uh, you know, in the low to moderate income areas. So that is a focus that we, that is primary with us um, in all that we do and all of the funding that we use uh, so that as something that is, is on the forefront of our planning process. Chairman Srivastava, Srivastava. Yeah. Srivastava Patel. You're doing so much better. I'm, I'm so proud. Right. <laughs> <laughs> again, we'll have a naming class after this. Um, again, you know, DHEC, I'm sure of you know, first concern is the community and the well being of the community and the health of the community. So if it's negatively impacting or if we need to come in and help regulate, then we do. But our, just like uh, Director Duncan was saying, is our forefront is the stakeholders in the community. Yeah, I would say from an economic development uh, perspective, you know, obviously we work uh, closely with uh, our local communities and determine, uh, help them determine what, what where areas of their community uh, they want to designate for uh, uh, de industrial development, uh, and, and uh, those are the sites that we are, that we uh, show businesses. You know, I think uh, the other thing is to, to is that when we locate uh, a business uh, in South Carolina, we try to really make it a net positive. <clears throat> in the case of uh, Volvo, for example, when they located in Berkeley County, uh, we were able to. Um, uh, establish uh, an environmental mitigation which added uh, literally thousands of acres uh, for preservation adjunct to the, the Francis Beadler uh, forest uh, which was uh, an incredibly positive environmental impact. Uh, Scout Motors uh, we just announced uh, or proposed uh, a mitigation plan that would preserve uh, 5,000 acres of land adjunct, adjunct to the Congaree National Swamp uh, which we believe is an incredibly, will be incredibly positive in terms of preserving uh, that overall natural environment uh, for our state. You know, our governor, uh, McMaster, is certainly very committed uh, to conservation and to preserving the natural beauty of our state. We are, uh, I think, truly blessed to have uh, the most beautiful state in the, in the country, and uh, we, we want to preserve that. We want to uh, build businesses, bring businesses to our state that are committed to preserving that and uh, continue to enhance the quality of life for our citizens. So, um, you know, that, that is certainly our philosophy in terms of economic development. Um, so with that, I think our time is up. I'll just conclude by saying, you know, I think the future uh, is uh, very bright uh, for us. Uh, we look for continued uh, growth in South Carolina, but we are certainly committed to do that in a smart way, and I think there is a, a path forward in terms of our energy future, and I look forward to hearing from the, the other panels as we go forward. Thank you. That was a great panel. Great questions also. It's good to see engagement from, from you folks in the crowd. Um, I'm really excited about this next panel. It's an economic development panel. <clears throat> and I'm particularly excited um, because our lieutenant governor is moderating this panel. And um, she is she's a wonderf wonderful person, as many of you may know. But she also has a great business background, so she fits perfect as the moderator for this panel. Um, this panel will explore the future demand for increased power from a manufacturing and business perspective. Um, we have some really great folks on this panel, and if the panelists want to come on up and, and we can go ahead and get seated and started. Um, the panel is going to discuss the vital role of energy and economic development in manufacturing. The discussion will attempt to highlight the importance of building strong relationships with government with business entities to facilitate collaborative solutions that will shape the future of energy and drive economic development and prosperity in South Carolina. Well, thank you, Stone. And good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many smiling faces on an early Friday morning. Uh, I'm Pamela Evett, and it's great to be with my panelists here. 
to talk about business. Uh, because before I've taken my current role as Lieutenant Governor, uh, business was my entire career. And I can, I'm glad to see Duke over here in the front right corner. Mike, I know it was always a scary day when I was uh, acting as president of QBS because if you, my name came up on your caller ID, they were doing rock, paper, scissors to see who was going to take that call because uh, that meant that my company was now working on generator power, which meant that hundreds of thousands of employees across our nation were in jeopardy of not getting their payroll checks on time, and that is a problem. Uh, nobody wants to get that call that your employees aren't going to be paid that day. So energy was vitally important to us at QBS, and I always thank you to Duke Energy for always keeping us up and running and always answering my call for sure. Um, you know, now as my role as Lieutenant Governor, uh, as I travel around the state, um, businesses always are focusing on energy and what's happening across our country. I wanna say thank you to Governor McMaster, always leading the way when it comes to public-private partnerships making sure that we bring business to the table. It was the one thing when I was in business that I would complain to my husband David about all the time, is why does government never bring us to the table? We're the experts, we know what we need, we know what we want, um, and we never get that seat. But Governor McMaster has always done that. We saw that through COVID, we've seen it through the EV, the electric vehicle process, and now again with energy. So thank you to the governor. Um, for showing great leadership when it comes to that. And I hope it gives you all uh, a sense that you are a partner at the table, because it definitely does, uh, definitely does for me. Uh, South Carolina, when it comes to economic development, as you've heard, is just off the charts. You know, in the upstate, you have BMW making more BMWs than anywhere in the world. South Carolina's fingerprints. You have Lockheed Martin making F-16 Block 70s in the upstate, keeping our allies safe all over the globe. South Carolina's fingerprints. Our boat builders, 26 of them, sending boats out to the Prince of Qatar. South Carolina's fingerprints are truly everywhere around the world. And I can go on and on, but we only have an hour for this panel, and I want to get to your questions. Um, but I want to welcome our great guests here this morning. We have Sarah Hazard. She is the president and CEO of the South Carolina Manufacturing Alliance. Thank you so much. You guys are always on the forefront of so much. Sandy Steele, the president of the South Carolina Economic Developers Association. And Mike Williams, the president, and strategic De the president of Strategic Development Group, Inc. Thank you all so much for coming this morning. Uh, South Carolina's business is business, so this is a really important panel. Uh, so I want to start off so everybody can hear a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your role and the importance of energy in your role. And let's start it off with Sarah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Hazard. I'm president and CEO of the South Carolina Manufacturers Alliance. You know, obviously, energy is very important to the manufacturers of this state, um, you know, being that you know, we are some of the largest consumers of electricity, of natural gas, um, naturally through, you know, electricity, natural gas being one of the key inputs into the manufacturing process. You know, having um, competitively priced, reliable power is really imperative for manufacturers to continue to thrive in this state. And I'm really excited to be here today to have this conversation and, and learn more. Thank you, Sarah. Let's, uh, Sandy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm, my name is Sandy Steele. I am the president of the South Carolina Economic Developers Association, or SCADA, as we're best known. Um, SCADA is the association that has been around for over 60 years. We represent economic developers at all levels, counties, uh, regional, and state level from around the state. Uh, energy is key to the business that we do. It is impossible to recruit new industries or help existing industries expand without the infrastructure needs being met. So we, too, are very excited to be at the table today to share our, our input on that. Thank you so much. And Mark, I'm sorry I called you Mike before. I'm still thinking about Mike Callahan over there. It's still on my mind, but Mark. All good. All good, role. Lieutenant Governor. Thanks for being here. And uh, I, uh, Governor and, and Secretary, too, uh, we work in a lot of states, and this kind of event 
with the guest list that's here and the topics, you guys really are, I think, leading the charge in a lot of ways, and that's great to see. So I am, I'm Mark Williams. Uh, I've lived in South Carolina for about 40 years. Uh, my company, which I founded, is a site selection company. We help major industries figure out where to locate, uh, automotive, tire, chemical, et cetera. And so we live in South Carolina. We operate out of South Carolina, but we worked in 40 states last year. And so we, we have the perspective of patriots in being here and having located some very big load projects here, but also are working in other places. But I think our, our perspective, which I hope to talk a little about, is what are our clients telling us? because we're dealing with this situation every day where we have clients that are looking for sites. Of course, there's a real estate decision, but as you know, there are labor decisions, logistics decisions, and this energy decision, this energy analysis is becoming uh, more and more important. A, because the loads are getting much larger, uh, and, and B, there, there are some challenges in, in terms of reliability and some other things. So look forward to that, but site selection is my perspective. Well, Mark, I'm gonna start it off with you okay. because you're kind of outnumbered on the stage. I figure we should start out with you. What are some areas that we do well in with regards to energy compared to other states? And what are some areas we could improve on? Well, in an overall sense, Lieutenant Governor, South Carolina has been and continues to ramp up its, its service to companies uh, when they look here. Uh, I have to tell you, being on the outside sometimes, South Carolina is talked about by other states as a, as a feared competitor. I hear Good that. You may not hear that, but I hear that. Um, so there, there's kind of the, the government perspective, which has always been quite good, but frankly, is getting much, much better now. Uh, then there's the utility perspective. The utilities in this state, the investor-owned utilities and, and Santee Cooper and the power team, et cetera, uh, do an excellent job relative to servicing clients who have big loads, unique loads, whether that's electricity or gas. Um, you know, I would, I would rank South Carolina among the top five states we deal with in terms of that level of service. There are other states we work in where we have a large load. Uh, gee, uh, and, and we need to make a decision. The site selection process is a funnel. You have a lot of locations you need to end up at one. And if, and if a, an investor-owned utility tells you they need, you know, eight months to do a, a study about how your load can be served, that's a little tough in making a decision. We don't see that in South Carolina. So speed, caring, involvement makes a difference. And so that's a strength. Uh, I don't want to call it a weakness, and we'll, we'll probably get into it, but you know, we're, the, the green energy movement has, has changed some things. Uh, we're decarbonizing, shutting down fossil plants, and Frankly, we, we, we probably need to get some more gas in this state. We, we, need, uh, we, we need more hard generation. Uh, green is beautiful, and, and I, I think to strengthen the state's position, we really need to accelerate that. Thank you so much. And kind of going along with that, um, Sarah, because you started talking about green energy, uh, a lot of manufacturers have clean energy goals and a lot of customers are demanding that manufacturers be sustainable. Uh, this includes uh, energy that powers their processes. So how are manufacturers dealing with those demands? You know, I think um, as manufacturers are trying to figure out, you know, how they can meet those demands, they're looking at the various ways to work and support the utilities um, as they pursue cleaner energy options. Um, they're looking at R&D and ways to invest and, and, again, support the utilities and looking for um, other things like small modular reactors, um, hydrogen. Um, there's, you know, the, the clean energy kind of movement that's out there, the, the goals that, that companies are setting, that their customers are demanding. They're looking for the opportunities to meet those demands. Um, 
So I think just really continuing to work for to find those ways to get creative um, and find other renewable, clean energy, carbon-free generation um, is really what, what folks are doing these days. Now, have you heard from our corporate partners or any of them as they're looking at South Carolina? Has it put a stop to what they were trying to do from coming here because we didn't have enough options for them, or is that something that we've never had to deal with? You know, I don't necessarily deal with the companies as they're looking to come into the state. Um, you know, when, when they get here, um, the existing industry folks I know are wanting to continue to grow and expand. Um, I know that they are certainly working with the utilities to um, try to find those creative ways. Some are looking for ways to generate their own renewable energy sources as well um, and, and partnering with utilities to be able to do that. That's wonderful. Sandy, so we're keeping with this. How are we trying to get our new employers to come here to South Carolina? We know that a lot of decisions drive uh, where an industry will want to locate. What are those main factors and how important is energy when they're making those decisions? Sure. Well, you know, the key drivers for any project are specific to the project. But they all share one commonality. I think Mark would back me up on this. One of the first um, requests is location. Maybe they need proximity to the port, proximity to a market. Here in South Carolina, we are blessed because we have such access to the entire southeastern market. So that gives us a geographical advantage. So it kind of starts with that, and then it narrows down from there. But one of the second key drivers that is always important is infrastructure and utilities. Um, it's important that we understand that in economic development and when a company is making a decision, you, our infrastructure and our energy and utility capacities are not an extra. They're not an incentive. They're expected. It is not to up the ante. That's, that's your play to get in the game. And because those investments take so much time and so much money, it's wonderful that we're having this conversation today because to Mark's point, I wanted to jump up and shout amen, but I didn't because I didn't know if y'all had enough coffee this morning. <laughs> but um, it's generation and natural gas. I mean, other states have it. If we want to grow, we have to have it, not just for our companies, but for the commercial growth and the residential growth that comes throughout. So it's, energy is integral and it is a long-term fix, so it's great that we're having this conversation. But what I would also add to that in terms of key drivers for projects um, that layer on, over on location and utility and infrastructure availability is a business-friendly climate. These companies are looking to invest anywhere from $10 million to uh, you know, $300 billion of hard-earned capital, private capital generally into a company and they're looking for a location they have no intention of just having their current business plan be where they are in five years they're looking to locate in a place where their investment they can partner with state and, and um, local regulatory agencies and have an opportunity to grow because they're going to be constantly looking for new markets new customers adding new processes and that's going to require additional energy additional footprint creation of new jobs so it's a win-win for everybody but they're looking for a location and mark you correct me if you're not seeing the same thing you know you know i'm preaching from he's the getting ready to jump in i think yeah. in a minute that's right, and so you absolutely jump in, but it's important that we maintain, and we have, I think you're right, and South Carolina's been known as the Palmetto for years, started under Governor Campbell. We are known for a business climate that is um, biz a business-friendly climate. We've got to balance that with our regulatory needs, but we've got to have regulatory processes that move at the speed of business, because that's what generates their investment. I'm on a soapbox, sorry. You know, I, Sandy, I agree with everything you said. I mean, but there, there's some things that that are are changing in addition to all that. Uh, there, the, the the load profiles of many of the clients we deal with now are increasing. So it used to be, you know, a, a 25 or a 50 megawatt electricity load was a big deal. Now it's 100, 200, 500, 700. So these loads are are, are getting greater and greater. Uh, you know, we had the data center boom years ago, and, and, and you know, this whole AI thing is another, going to be another boom in data center. So in the, in the midst of uh, implementation of, of well-thought green energy policies, uh, we've got companies who are, are, are very concerned about energy 
It's a big part of their cost of goods sold, so it matters. It's got to be reliable. They can't be interrupted or they'll be shut down. Um, so energy for many is becoming, it used to be somewhat a nice to have. I mean, we all need energy, but you know, if we had to pay a little higher for it, we would. But now there's so many other critical site location factors that we're seeing because to me, the loads are increasing and, and the, the policy toward decarbonization, which is a good one, uh, is, is, is there too. So it's a really interesting time and we find a lot of our site selection projects uh, that are energy intensive, often we're asked to begin with utilities. I mean, if the, if the electricity or gas isn't there and it's not going to be interrupted and the price is reasonable, so that's where we start, and that's changing too. Mark, that brings up a great point. Um, I was out at CMC in Casey not long ago. A client of ours. Oh, well, that's great. What a great company. And I was just shocked. So for me and, and what I did prior to this, keeping the lights on, keeping energy flowing was important. But at CMC, it was the volume. And, and hearing what they paid in energy costs and you know going out to their factory and seeing that steel meltdown process happen. You, you know, the way they talked that um, Dominion just had a whole wall for them and that you, know, you almost just see the energy draining as those furnaces came up. But yeah, for them, and, that's and, and, important. And, 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 you know, th th they're great about what I'm just talking about. We've located three CMC mills in the U.S. in the last six years. Uh, there are lots of steel mills looking, and and they can't just interrupt their process. No. They just can't, they can't do that. And there are many other businesses that can't either. And, and you're right. You know, we said, I, one of the panelists said it earlier, you know, when you talk about just the abundance of resources, you know, and, and now we have pulled away from some of that because of federal regulations. We talked a little bit about that back and how important that becomes, you know, energy costs for a company like that that relies so much on pulling that kind of kilowatt is just astronomical. Just a slight change by turning off some other energy factors really causes um, their bottom line to change a great deal. So. In, in, in their process, like some others, is, is very green, getting greener, it's electrified, uh, and, and that's what's happening in this country. Uh, so they're they're part of that that whole that whole process. Great company, and, nice and by the way, lots of six figure salaries for people working in the manufacturing environment. So in terms of economic impact and economic benefit, very powerful. Oh yeah, and we can get off talking about our world class technical colleges. If that's a that's a panel for a whole nother day, right, when it comes to that. Um, so this question, uh, we're going to, it's going to be for, for Sarah and Mark. Sarah, I'm going to have you start it out. Um, when you talk with manufacturers, what do they say is the most important thing they attribute to energy when it comes from determining um, where to locate um, and their expanding when it comes to their existing operations? Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, generally speaking, when you know, manufacturers are operating, they've got to have reliable power. It's got to be you know, uh, cost effective um, with a low and stable cost. Um, you know, they're also, again, looking at what the generation mix is in South Carolina, um, making sure that we've got those renewable options available. Um, you know, they care about these things because their customers are caring about these things. And again, they've got um, really to meet the demands of their customers. Um, and they're also looking for a resilient grid as well. Um, so I think those are really the primary things. Again, just renewable, reliable, um, cost efficient, um, cost effective power. You, you know, it's, it's interesting to tag onto that <clears throat> 15 years ago, many of our clients would have us eliminate areas if the energy stack had green energy in it. They didn't, they didn't want to be near green energy. The price was higher. Solar was 18 cents. It was unreliable. They didn't think it was stiff. And it's just so interesting how pretty much across the board, everybody wants that piece. Uh, everybody. It's it, not just consumer brand companies, but, right. but everybody. 
I, I, everything you said I agree with. There are a couple of things in terms of site location that I think are important in terms of, in addition to reliability, et cetera. And, and the key one for me is timing. Uh, timing or bad timing kills deals. So uh, for, for states that, that want to compete for projects or communities, if they can't deliver answers about key assets reasonably quickly, that's a problem and they'll get passed over to someone that can. Uh, so at the, at the outset of a project, if it takes eight months to figure out if somebody can be served and, and how that's going to look, that's a problem if the decision has to be made. They're going to get passed over. Uh, if it takes three years to deliver gas or electricity, uh, that's a problem. I mean, there's a shortage of transformers and other things that everybody here knows about, but that's a problem. So in addition to all the great things you say, said, I think timing kills deals and more, and more energy is the reason for that on the front end and the back end. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, and Mark, this might be for you. Is there one type of renewal, renewable energy that somebody really keys in on, and is there another type that they kind of go, mm, not so sure about that, if, if that is what they, if you, if you had a list, how would you rank them? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, I think a big, a big part of the current challenge with green energy is reliability. You know, if we had a coal-fired electricity plant, that was probably not so good from a carbon emissions perspective, but very good from the perspective of it was contained, the technology was known, it could be operated 24-7, we always knew it was there. If I've got solar or wind, uh, gee, I'm just not sure. And what if there's a hailstorm, or what if the sun sets, or, or whatever? So, um, I, I, I think uh, I mean a lot of our clients are, are in, very interested in solar. <coughs> it, it can be installed. We call it behind the meter, meaning on their site or in front of the meter, as a as a supplement, as a, as a supplement. Uh, so, I, I think solar is probably most popular. Okay. Well, thank you. Sandy, we haven't forgot about you down there. Um, what trends are you seeing in the site selection projects related to energy requirements and qualification of the sites related to energy availability? Sure. Well, I think Mark hit on a few of them earlier. But, of course, the electric vehicle, uh, the rise of that that's been so rapid is really re uh, putting forth projects that require lo electric loads that used to be the size of a small city. I mean, it's kind of massive, but even before and in addition to that, um, South Carolina has done a great job of pursuing advanced manufacturing. And in advanced manufacturing, you're gonna have more computerized equipment. Even distribution is moving to more robotics, again, requiring electricity. So it's kind of been the perfect storm raising the demand for electricity, and we're also seeing trends in natural gas. Um, natural gas has been an issue for years, but it's really beginning to um, a, a crisis level in the state in terms of the ability to bring that in. And again, none of these solutions are long-term because what do we need for more electricity? We've got to generate more. I mean, transmission and distribution is a part of it, but if I have nothing to send down the pipe, they're not doing me any good. What are we generating? How can we generate more? Because we can't grow without it. Natural gas, along those same lines, with natural gas, we don't generate that. We've got to pipe it in, and that's going to take cooperation throughout with different states. Um, but we're going to need those, again, to grow and be competitive. One of the exciting things about this is South Carolina as a state has done so well. When you look at where we were when the textile industry went offshore decades ago, Mark and I actually saw that. Now, we're not quite that old. We just might look at some days. <laughs> But how we've reinvented ourselves first with manufacturing, and then we've evolved into advanced manufacturing, and now we are embracing the electric vehicles. It's really wonderful to see how we've grown our state, and we've been so successful, um, particularly in our congested, in our most developed areas, Columbia, Charleston, and Greenville. But with these um, successes, now we have the opportunity to expand. I know you're smiling. You know where I'm going. That we have the, the opportunity to expand this into the more rural areas. We've all talked for decades about growing the entire area of our state and how do we take prosperity out there because a good paying job at home 
changes the generational uh, track of a family. It allows people to not commute and be at their children's ball game. So it really enhances our quality of life. So how do we take these opportunities as we build out more generation, as we bring in more natural gas, and in a very, um, in a way that keeps our quality of life, take the success and take our economic development out into all the rural areas. Mark, you knew you, it's my soapbox, y'all. Those of y'all who don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, are you look at you. You're you're thinking. I can see your wheels turning. I'm I'm, I'm thinking about a a story, and and I I, I agree with Sandy. Uh, I think the day of rural is development is coming. Uh, to me, uh, rural areas, rural communities, all have assets, and frankly, a lot of them have liabilities. And it's, it's kind of like my wife. I think she loves me for my assets and kind of <laughs> ignores my liabilities. And, and Now you're speaking my language. That's, yeah, that's accounting and, talk and we're I talking now. In terms of rural development, the day is coming. Uh, and rural communities need to find companies that love them for their assets and aren't worried about their liabilities. And it is pushing out. We're seeing that right now in South Carolina. It's pushing out. And, the, and, and, and you're home area where you've worked in terms of the Savannah River site in that area, and we're talking about Westinghouse and modular generation, I mean, there must be lots and lots of great new opportunities for rural development. Sarah, something to add about that on the rural side? I know with like Tim Scott's Opportunity Zones and things like that, we have really tried hard um, to pass some of those benefits on to whether we have existing manufacturers here in the state or maybe somebody trying to come in. You know, what are you saying? Is, is it a hard sell to try to get them there yet or are we finding it's getting easier and easier? Well, I think, I mean, the biggest challenge that manufacturers are facing, you know, just hands down, is, is people, workers, <coughs> workforce, um, and I mean, that's particularly hard in those rural areas. So um, the more that we can do as a state to foster the growth of our future talent, um, the, the better off that we'll be. No question. Well, yeah. again, uh, something to give the governor a lot of credit for, um, really focusing on workforce scholarships, making advanced manufacturing one of those core um, scholarship goals that we're trying to get out to people. And, and I see it. Um, you know, as a mom, I, I tell this story a lot. Uh, you know, my dad was a tool and die maker. So I never thought blue and gray collar work was a bad thing, but as a nation, we kind of overcorrected. And when my middle son decided he didn't want to go the four-year college route, uh, the shock and awe in everybody's face is when it first hit me what we've done. But I think we've done a great job, the governor and I, using our platform and our microphone to really turn the minds and hearts. And it's not of the kids, right? It's of the parents and grandparents um, why manufacturing is not dirty, dark, and dangerous anymore, right? And it is fun and it's exciting and you're talking about robots and it's a big video game that you get to go to work every day and do and and we are really trying to turn that around so I think we're I think we're making strides I, I'm very confident about it I hope you're seeing that too on the manufacturing yeah, absolutely I mean government master um, has been a leader on this you, know, you mentioned the technical colleges um, the scholarships that are free for students to go for these high demand careers um, I mean, the more that we can continue to do in that regard, I think we'll only continue to help our state. Which will become a, a continued energy problem, right? Because the more we get them coming in, and we see that with our growth in economic development, Secretary Lightsey talked about that earlier, with all the EV plants that are coming in, whether it's batteries or vehicles, um, we continue to grow. As we grow that workforce, we become more and more um, exciting as a state to come to, and there we go. Can I comment on that? Sure. A little bit of self-promotion, perhaps, <laughs> but it, agreeing with this and this whole concept, uh, one of the things our company does every year in South Carolina is we sponsor buses to take teachers and guidance counselors to manufacturing facilities so that they can see what's going on, and it's been interesting to me to understand when I'm with these people, the teachers and guidance counselors, they really didn't understand uh, that that the recent graduate at Bridgestone and Aiken was, you know, making eighty thousand dollars. They they didn't know. No. They didn't know. And so we've we've taken uh, guidance counselors and teachers to Bridgestone. We've taken them to 
Nutramax, we're, we're taking them to the Ports Authority this year. So I say that maybe not so much as self-promotion, but I think all of us can try to stimulate that and not be one-offs, but ev maybe everybody in the room. I mean, we really need to keep telling that story, all of us. I think, I think that's great. You're, you were just kind of echoing the message that the governor and I deliver every time we speak to a crowd, right? That's always my takeaway, is talking about, you know, mechatronics and what that does for our kids and, and what those kids are making with zero college debt, right? I think that's the key to that. But so, Mark, um, we're going to round it out with this question, then we're going to try to open it up to the audience. But what do you believe the state of South Carolina's general strategy should be related to winning project locations with significant energy requirements? And what's our strategy? That sounds like a question for Secretary Lights. <laughs> <laughs> well, he might ask you a question here in a second. I, I think South Carolina, uh, if I were asked the question, you've asked me, uh, energy is a, is a scarce resource. And if I were the state of South Carolina, and I was trying to be thoughtful and targeted to generate the greatest impact and benefit from these site locations, then I would apply scarce resources, whether that's labor draw or energy in this case, to those projects that created the greatest positive economic impact. So if there's a, a, a 500 megawatt project and it's going to create 25 low paying jobs, that's probably not on the list. So my guess is, I'm, I'm, I'm an observer, uh, <laughs> is that the, the, the smart people at the Department of Commerce and other officials are thinking more and more about how to leverage these resources to do more and being very thoughtful about it. And energy is one of those. Great. Secretary Lights, did you catch all that? <laughs> <laughs> he already knew yeah. that and more. So you guys are ready to open this up for questions from the audience? Sure. All right. Who has a question for our panelists? I think we have mics getting come around. You can choose them. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your knowledge with us. My name is Antonia Adams, and I am an intern in the governor's office. My question is, what do you believe is the economic future for low-income individuals when it comes to energy? Who would like to? I'll give it a crack. So um, I love your dress, by the way. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, so I think that economic, you know, to wrap it all up, bottom line is I think that as we create jobs, particularly jobs that are, um, are in advanced manufacturing with a higher skill level, that that has the opportunity to change uh, low-income individuals by raising their upward mobility. I love the pieces that we put in place. Of course, we have more work to do as a state, but um, as you mentioned, our uh, free training that has been offered through the state funds and the technical college system that's available, there's skill training to get a better job. To, and then we're working very hard to recruit companies that do provide um, jobs that, you know, it's not only just an initial good wage, but also some upward mobility. And that's what we're going to see as we see more advanced manufacturing, even in the distribution. Since it's robotics based, it may not be as many jobs, but the jobs would be more technical, maintaining that, more computerized. So again, I kind of go back to my analogy of when our economy was decimated, when the textiles went offshore, we had to reinvent ourselves. It started with what was called special schools back then. Who remembers when Red SC was called special schools? Let me see, there's my people, there you go. <laughs> I knew there's people my age. And what that did was it offered training to people in um, manufacturing equipment, which was mainly mechanized at that point. And then we've evolved into our, our great success recruiting all the automotive, automotive industry, and now we're going into manufacturing. So I, I guess my opinion is that we are keeping up with this as a state with the needs, and energy is going to play a piece in that because energy is not only going to drive that computerization and that advanced in manufacturing and the location, it's also going to go drive the quality of life, the Wi-Fi. So I think it goes hand in hand with not only low income individuals, but our middle class as well, because we're all looking to do a little better, right, for the next generation. My opinion, please. I absolutely agree. I, 
I'd love for there not to be so many low com income individuals. And uh, I think education is tra and training is, is critical. And I know the governor and lieutenant governor are working hard on that. Um, you know, it used to be that after a recession, we'd get all our jobs back. And if you look at the last two or three recessions, we don't get all the jobs back. There's another whack of automation and fewer people are getting their jobs back. And, and that is going to be more and more a profound trend. So uh, from, from zero to 18, and maybe more importantly, zero to, I'm going to say, 10 years old is a pretty critical time, in my opinion. And I think one thing that we really are focusing on, and I was at a, um, a youth uh, workforce challenge yesterday, where they were doing youth workforce uh, initiatives. You know, our, our high school students, that is the biggest drop of applicants we've seen uh, around, not just here in South Carolina, in our country. So for all the parents out there um, that have maybe a 16-year-old like I do who's sitting on the couch, we need to get them working again. Because what businesses need and what they're craving is employees that have soft skills. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, somehow we've lost um, the enthusiasm for high school students, early college students, to get out there and start working again. And that's where you will learn your most valuable skills. Uh, you know, it's, it's way better to have bad soft skills at 16 uh, and get corrected than at 26 when you have a master's program degree and you've never been out there working. So that's something, too, that we really want to continue to push here in South Carolina. But uh, we need all the parents in the room to get behind us with that one because we're the ones that are kind of scooting them out the door. Uh, so I'm, I'm proud to say that my 16-year-old will be working this summer like he did last summer. And I don't know, the jobs now for a 15-year-old, he'll be making $15 an hour as a lifeguard. So they're great jobs that we have all in our state. And businesses need those kids. Uh, they need them in those entry-level jobs, and we need them uh, as manufacturers and employers uh, when they get out of college or technical colleges or whatever path they decide to choose. So do we have another question? We have a few more minutes. Lieutenant Governor, thank you, and everyone, thank you for the great uh, panel today. My name is Peggy Smedley, and I'm uh, the uh, founder of Specialty Publishing Media, and I'm delighted to be here today. So I'm going to give you a tough question, no easy ones today. So <laughs> you've been talking about advanced technology, workforce shortages, and I think all these environmental trends. But the question I wrote down is, as you know, that's the perfect storm. You're seeing it. You just discussed it about 16-year-olds right now and, and trying to get jobs. But I guess the question is, with technology, it's disrupting. We've seen it with AI. We don't know what's going to happen with quantum. The question is here in South Carolina, how are you going to prepare for it? Because truly, you can't. So when you look at energy, you've got to be playing kind of a game of Russian roulette to try to plan for the future. So I guess the question for all of you, how do you do it with manufacturers? How do you do it in the built environment? Because they come together. Tough question. I thought I'd throw it out to you. I thought you said it was going to be an easy question. Didn't I hear that? Go ahead, Mark. I wasn't sure what the question was. Yeah, same. I, I, we, weren't, we got everything that you said, but unsure exactly what the question is. I'm sorry. I think it's the balance. That's what I got. Where is the balance? Exactly. The question is it's, it's disruption. You, you can't plan for disruption, so how are you going to plan for the disruption knowing that all these things are kind of coming together? As it relates to energy? Well, it's interesting. We have all this disruption, but, but every one of us wants the light switch, the light to come on, the refrigerator to be on. Uh, if you're operating a 24-7 operation, there can be all kinds of disruption on the outside, but it better not disrupt my process or I'm going to have a real problem. Um, that's a complicated question, as you said, but I think in a general sense, in my opinion, as we, we move toward this decarbonization as I keep talking about it we, we have to have an eye on on reliability uh, and and how do we I'm gonna say and I it's above me but from a regulatory perspective how do we squeeze risk out of the energy equation so that the amount of electricity or gas 
or hydrogen. We can talk about that in six months. Maybe we'll know more then. Uh, but how do, how do we squeeze the risk out of it? Because we, I don't think our homes or our businesses are ready for their power to be disrupted. So we, we have to work to avoid that the best we can. And I would just add to that, if I could, in addition to the risk, it's the timing. Um, I, I think I'm, somebody on the former panel brought it up, or maybe you did, Mark, you know, two and a half to three years to increase the amount of, you know, the transmission line or to, get, you know, five years for a natural gas permit. That's unacceptable in terms of growth. We, we cannot grow residentially, commercially, or industrially where we do not have power. So how do we reduce the amount of time that's needed in a way that still preserves our quality of life? And so I think a part of that kind of goes back to the regulatory environment um, because there are so many different layers and all of this is evolving. But if we don't find a way to decrease that time so that we can actually achieve some of these goals, I mean, which community is going to say, no, you, you, you can't move here. It'll be three years and then you can move here. Or to your point, you know, which community is going to say, well, no, we're, you're going to have to tell this business they have to go home. So I think that's something that we can do as a state, working together with leadership. This is a wonderful forum to discuss that. But I just wanted to add, in addition to the risk, that you know, we need to collectively, we're smart people. We've overcome other obstacles. How do we reduce the amount of time and needing to, so we can increase our generation so we can get the natural gas piped into our state? You know, I was just going to echo what you just said. It's really good having people that understand what the problems are. Uh, I think we, I don't know if Seema is still in the room, but, you know, this is a business person who understands how critical that timing is. And, and having those people at the helm and being able to relate to things that are going on, I, I have found in my role as lieutenant governor, it's always great to be at businesses and really understand what they're saying when they're talking about bottom line, when they're talking about energy costs going up, when they're talking about workforce and labor, like these things resonate. And so uh, I just wanna echo what you're, you, you had just said, is that having us all in the room and letting the people making those decisions and doing those processes understand just the negative impacts that it has on a business and how it is life or death when you're trying to put somebody in a location and you can't get answers. So. Um, again, that's where these forums and these, this collaboration really works well. So I think we have, we have time. For, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say I think that's great, but we've got to do more than talk because Georgia, North Carolina, they're, they're at this same conversation. So to stay competitive, let's follow this up with a little bit of action. And, and in terms of site selection, uh, yes is a wonderful answer in terms of delivery of energy or other assets. No is totally acceptable, but maybe is a cut. You're cut, we're going somewhere else. Maybe it doesn't work. Right. Or we're talking about it and we're gonna. Mm -mm. And, and kudos, you know, what, I heard, what I've heard over and over, uh, whether it's with Thorne uh, down by the coast or what we heard from Scout when Scout came, is it was that quick decision making and having yeah. people that understood how critical that timing was is what brought them here. And so very proud of what we've been doing here in South Carolina to really cut through that red tape, those maybes, uh, to get people at the table that can make the decision, right? And so uh, kudos to Commerce and to everybody that are involved because it, it really makes all the difference when, when getting new, especially new industry here, here in our state. So, with that, I think we're out of time. I want to thank you three. It's been great. Um, and uh, thank you all for the great question. Well, that was a great panel. So we will have a 10 minute break, um, short, short break, and then we'll get into another panel right before lunch. <laughs>